Okay, guys, so this is the uh, building science and services part two, a continuation of the part one. This is about the topic lighting. So part one, we talk, uh, uh, we go through a lot of the formula. So now we are talking about, we we'll just go through briefly on the lamps and the remaining parts of the topic. Lah. So there will be one more final calculation to this and then the rest will be all just additional information and knowledge for you guys to learn about. Lah. Okay, so for in lamp, there's actually three functions to lighting, which is task, movement, and display. So for task is to provide enough lighting for people to carry out activity, movement, so that we are able to see and move about safely, and display. So during the daylight, you won't, lighting isn't a problem lah, because we have sun, but lighting is required for us to carry out our usual activity during night time when the light is not available. So just from the moonlight, if you, if you are at night, the moonlight isn't giving us enough illumination lah, to light up and to allow us to carry out our activity. So uh, moonlight is unreliable. That's, that's why we need all this artificial lighting so that we are able to carry out our usual activity during night time and we are able to move about safely during night time and also inside a building. So it's not always a case where you'll be able to have natural lighting inside a building. For example, if you have a small house, yes, you may have lighting all over uh, you may have natural lighting all over your house with the usage of opening a window but let's say for example you are in an airport so i hope all you guys been to an airport you know that airport is a very very big building so it's able to cover a very very big area if you were to take notice of the your surrounding it's not always that you will find that you have like a uh, natural lighting available to you. Let's say for the washroom, because you want privacy inside a washroom, you don't want anyone to pick at you. So that's where all this lighting is required, or maybe a storeroom, for example. So if you are in an enclosed room where natural lighting is not possible, you need artificial lighting. So if you don't have this artificial lighting, you won't be able to carry out any activity in the room. Lah. So for example, a uh, washroom, so you don't want to dirty yourself. Lah. That's, uh, that's to say, and you don't want to just bump into any washroom equipment installed inside. Okay, so this is the three idea of why you require lighting. So just a bit of information on what the, the product of lighting. So other source of lighting comes from fire, candle, oil, or kerosene. So all this deals with flames. So this is our other source of lighting. Eh? So now modern source, there's two types, which is discussed here. So uh in these notes, the, the LED will not be discussed. So you have to go and find out and fill up for your assignment lah, if your building are using LED. So modern source, there's the incandescent lamp, tungsten filament lamp, and fluorescent lamp or discharge lamp. So the first one is this lamp. So they are produced by heating substance to a temperature at which they glow and are luminous. So if you see the picture here, this is like the light bulb. Lah. So how this works by providing you artificial lighting is electric current is passed through this light bulb. So once electric current is passed through this light bulb, if you see here, let me do a quick expansion of this photo. So if you can see here, 
there's actually a thin wire. So when light, when electricity is passed through this light bulb, and light, uh, this metal thing will heat up, and it will illuminate the area. So this is how this type of light bulb give you light. It's through electricity, like uh, powering up this device and making this very very hot, and then this will in turn generate heat and also lighting. So this is the general lighting service lamp. It's the most common light bulb and it's actually very cheap, simple to install, but the lifespan is very short. So because this is the most uh, this is a the new the old modern light bulb. So its efficiency isn't very very good because it's the idea behind how this light would uh, provide you light is through heating up this filament. So a lot of the energy is lost towards the heat. So that's why here is highlighted in red. 5% of electrical energy is converted to visible light. So most of the energy consumed is released as heat. So this is not a very efficient uh, modern light bulb. Lah. So this is the first modern light bulb. So next we have this tungsten halogen lamp. So it used a small quality, uh, quantity of the halogen gas such as iodine and bromine. So it runs at a higher temperature. So it has a higher efficiency and longer lifespan, but it comes at a higher cost. Lah. And then we have a reflecting lamp. So instead of the lamp uh, giving light at all direction, if we know that through the properties of light, through experimenting, that light travels in a straight line. So if you were to just emit the light without any form of direction, then you will just emit it in a straight line. Lah. But if you were to put a shield towards it, like in this case, a spot lamp or this sealed beam lamp, where there's a path in which the, there's a shape that cover the light. This means that you are, you are able to direct the lamp in one direction. So the light will still reflect in all direction, but you have a more intense lighting because Instead of the light going to all direction, you have re the reflecting component hitting this, uh, hitting this parabolic form, and then it will redirect the light in the same direction as the direct lighting. So you have finally for this type of lamp, you have your low voltage bulb. So this filament is shorter and thicker and stronger. They will be so because it's shorter, thicker, and stronger, the heat output will be low. So usually this is used in shop for display of goods. Ah. Okay, so finally we have this fluorescent lamp. So this is what you will typically find in an office building or in your house. You can see here. So it produces light by passing an electric current through a gas or vapor. So once an electric gas passes through this lamp, the gas inside will become ionized and this will in turn give you electric uh, lighting. So this is using a mercury vapor at low pressure. So it provides a low glare. So if you look back at the light bulb that is usually available if you were to light it up because it is producing is because of the method it, it produced the light if you were to look directly at the light you'll notice that it will give you some uncomfortable glare but with this method of producing light 
the if you were to look directly at this fluorescent lamp so you won't notice that it's very very bright lah, that will give you a uncomfortable glare so one of a few of the fun advantages and disadvantage to this type of lamp is that it's a bit more expensive about 16 to 17 ringgit if you were to buy it at a hardware shop a uh, longer lifespan so this type of lamp lasts very long maybe up to at least uh, four to five years lah before you need to replace so maybe the light you need to replace the light or the starter you need to replace it and it gives a better luminous efficiency so this means that the electricity used to light up this lamp is more efficient as, compo as compared to the light bulb so it's a uh, rough comparison is about five times better instead of wasting all the heat energy in lighting the light you are ionizing the gas vapor so this is providing a better efficiency in terms of changing electrical energy into light energy because not a lot of heat is wasted or generated <clears throat> so this is a compact fluorescent lamp it's still the same thing so the table below shows a compact fluorescent lamp that deliver the same amount as a tungsten filament light bulb but only use one fifth the amount of electrical energy or money okay so this is a uh, two types of lamp available lah. so but now since as we go on in life there will be newer and newer technology such as the led light lah. but this is the first two modern lighting available to all of us with the first being the light bulb and the others being what we use when we don't have light bulb lah. Uh, what we use when we don't have the electricity energy sources so we use fire okay so there's two properties to a lamp which is the luminous efficiency and life so luminous efficiency is the ability of a lamp to convert electrical energy to light energy so this is this is the ability of the lamp on how efficient it is by changing the electrical energy available or being used to power up the lamp into lighting so as per previous comparison because of how the light bulb and the fluorescent lamp the way they are used uh, the way they light up the appliances one is using filament another one is using gas paper because of how they are built up to emit the light they have different efficiency so as we get more and more modern we find more and more ways to efficiency uh, effectively generate lighting then the efficiency of converting the electrical energy to lighting will be better so it won't always be the best but you will get better and better lah. so one of the main wastage of electric uh, electrical energy or low efficiency for a lamp is because heat is generated that's why uh, converting electrical energy into lighting isn't always efficient but this is just a fun fact lah. if you were to convert lighting into heat energy you will be able to very efficiently convert it into heat lah. but in Malaysia it's not really that important lah because we are a hot country but in a whole cold country it is good to know that if you were to use electricity you will be able to convert 100% of it into heat energy so this is a fun fact for you guys but do know that electrical energy if you were to use it to generate heat energy is the most expensive form of energy lah. so it's very expensive to generate electric energy to use it as a heat energy that's why we use more natural gas 
So this is just a fun fact for you guys. And the next one is properties of lamp for life. So the luminous efficiency of a lamp decreases over time. So all this luminous efficiency and the lifespan of the lamp is you can obtain this data sheet from the manufacturer. So in a large installation, it is economical to install all the lamp and you are able to know that all these lamp are you install is the same type so that you can replace them at a specific maintenance schedule. So you don't want to run the lamp until the lifespan over. If the manufacturer gives you a nominal lifespan, which is maybe 8,000 hours, so once the lamp reaches 8,000 hours, the luminous efficiency means the ability of the lamp to give the brightness will slowly decrease and maybe the lamp will need to be replaced. So it's always desirable to install the same types of lamp and once they reach the specified lifespan of what the manufacturer given is always good to change them all at the same time so and also before they spoil lah. so if they were to spoil before the lifespan then there's always be there's always this error from the manufacturer lah. but this data sheet that's been given by the manufacturer for the type of lamp you always mention how efficient the lamp is at providing the light through this unit uh, through this unit which is lumen and watt and also the lifespan so this is a table for characteristic of the electric lamp so usually you have the voltage range, how much electric energy is required to power up this lamp and the efficiency. So based on this electrical power, how much is it able to emit in terms of lighting? So these two, you just time them together, you get your, your lumen. And then how long, how, is, how long is the lifespan of this lamp and what sort of color temperature and typical applying application so there's a note here higher voltage lamp generally have higher efficiency and longer life so value for the efficiency and life of discharge lamp are subjected to improvement so as i said before as we get more and more technically advanced we will find more and more different way to light up uh, appliances to generate us lighting. Okay, so this is the calculation for lamp costing. So these examples give a comparison of two types of lamp. Lamp A and lamp B. So you need to light up a space for 20 hours a day and you require a total of 18,000 lumen of brightness. You are given two lamp and you are to consider the design using a costing period of two years. So you need to find out the initial cost, running cost, total cost of the two system over the two years. You are given the following information, lamp voltage, lamp efficiency, lamp life, installation cost, lamp cost, and electricity cost. So you need to find out the which is more expensive to install, replace, and operate. And also uh, for over for the period of two years. So for part A, uh, Okay, so let's just have a look at this. Uh, this will be more clear. So for lamp A, you, you are first to find out the total output per lamp. So each lamp 
how much brightness is able to emit, you need to multiply this lamp voltage, which is 100 watt, with lamp efficiency, which is 12 lumen per watt. So by multiplying this, you'll be able to remove the watt and you'll be able to get the lumen, which is here. So 100 multiplied by 12, you get one lamp A, which is the tungsten filament, is able to provide 1200 lumens. So you do the same for B. Lah. So A is able to provide this, B is able to provide this. And then you need to find out what is the number of lamp required. So based on the question, it says that this space needs a total of 18,000 lumens. So you just use 18,000 divided by lamp A, the brightness, 1,000 lumens. So for this case, you need 15 lamps. So you do the same for lamp B, you get 5. So based on this, you know that your installation cost and your part and labor is 2 ringgit and 70 cent. So you need to multiply it by 15 times. So in total, you get 40 ringgit and 50 cent. So you will do the same for this. Lah. So let's look back here. So installation cost, the uh, appliances, and then the part and labor. So this is, you need to do the fitting for the lamp. So different type of lamp type, they will have different type of fitting. So hence the cost difference. Lah. And then this is the lamp cost, which is 70 cent. So you need to buy the lamp and also install the lamp up. So this costs 70 each. <clears throat> so you have the installation cost, which is 30 ringgit, part and labor. So you need to buy it and install it, 10 ringgit and 50 cent. And in total, you get 40 ringgit and 50 cent. So you do the same for part B. Lah. Okay, so you need to find out the replacement cost, which is the second part. Because you are given a period of two years. So the question tells you that you have 20, the area need to be light up for 20 hours a day. So lamp cannot really run so long. There's always a lifespan to it. If you were to run it that long, then the efficiency will decrease or maybe it will just die off. Lah. So it needs to be replaced. So you have your total hour, which is the replacement cost. You need to find out how long is it over the course of two years. So you use two years multiplied by 365 days a year and multiply by 20 hours. So you obtain 14,600 hours. So times each lamp is replaced, you have your hours, and then you divide by your lifespan. So you get about 14.6, you have to round it up, which is 15. And then you will be able to find out your replacement cost since you already calculated it previously here, which is part and labor. So you have to minus out the one of it because this is the total time. So you minus out one of it, 14 multiplied by 70 cent with a total replacement of all your lighting for the area, you come up with about 147 ringgit. So you do the same for land B. Lah. And then finally, you have your electricity cost. So you have to have 1000 divided, uh, sorry, 100 divided by 1000 to convert it into kilowatts, and then you are to multiply it by the hours. So you'll get 1460 kilowatts per hour. So you just minus your electricity cost, which is 0 0.08 per kilowatts hour. So that's why you need to divide by 1000 here to convert it into kilowatts hour. I think I remove this better. So by multiplying this part 
with 1000 you will be able to convert this into kilo lah. so uh, this k is a uh, si unit and then with that you'll be able to find out the energy cost for your lab which is 1752 so you do it the same for lamp b you'll find that because this uses less lighting therefore the cost is also low and also the voltage okay so if you were to add all the costs together you'll find that total cost of running over two years for lamp a is 1935 and for lamp b is only 430 so based on this it's only asking you to compare if you just end it here then it's enough for this question lah. but if the question is asking you to give some comment then you need to or recommendation or which to choose then you need to at the end of here just write a quick comment you recommend to choose lamp b because it's cheaper to install uh, it's cheaper over the two years cost although it's more expensive to install at first so you just give this sort of comment and you'll be given full mark lah. so please read the question carefully what sort of requirement or what sort of answer is expecting you to give so not just to blindly follow the example here lah. so this example here although it's already given to you all the answer please do practice your tutorial and when it comes to your test and also your final e-assessment so do read the question carefully and uh, answer it to the full lah. so it's not only up to what is shown in the example you also need to read the question and understand the question in this case it's not asking you to uh, recommend which to use and comment or and comment on the lamp a and b but if the question were to ask you to comment on lamp a and b then this is not the end of the answer lah, when you do when you tally out your total cost over two years so you just need to write out recommendation to choose lamp b due to the low cost over two years <clears throat> okay so this is how you do for the lamp costing lah. okay so next is the luminaries so lighting as i previously stated in the types of lighting available like the light bulb or the fluorescent lamp <coughs> they come in many many ways so either it's a directional lighting which is a direct light so 100 percent of it is directed or it's a mixed light either 70 percent directed 30 percent directed or 50 50 30 70 or all is indirect light so there are a lot of ways lighting can be done so the most normal way or the most cost efficient way is to direct all the lighting lah. but as we get more and more modern and we want to have things that look nice we want to make use of this indirect light so in a lot of modern area something like interior design you'll find that you will not be able to see lighting you will not be able to see the light lighting application so but you still feel that the area is bright and there's a uh, lighting there so this is all dealing with indirect light let's see let me show <coughs> okay so this is a good example uh,
Okay, so if you see here, you won't actually uh you ignore this. If you were to see at this picture, you won't actually be able to see the lighting directly. That's because it is covered. So this is uh some ID work lah, to create a very good ambience for the room. So one of the good thing about this is there's no glaring to it. You won't be able to see the lighting, but there's a downside to it lah because you need to install more lighting and it will cause your electricity bill to go up. But this is a way that will make your area looks very, very clean and neat and uh, provide a very good ambience. Ah. So this is how different, different lighting can be in a building. So as we advance in technology and as more and more design is there and available and the information is available all around us, we always find new different way to present something. So this is how lighting is presented now lah, as a modern way of living. So this, let me see if I can do a quick drawing. Okay, so let's see. Let me see if I can draw it up. <coughs> you guys don't have to join. Lah. So I just draw it up. You can see on your screen. <coughs> so this sort of lighting, they are done in this way. So this is your ceiling. It's a bit ugly. So this is your ceiling. So you have you are here. <coughs> so this is your ceiling, you're here. The lighting installation you see is something like this. So the light is actually installed here. So what sort of uh, the lighting that you have is indirect lighting. So the light will hit from will bounce from here to here and here. So this is how it lights up your area. Lah. So this is how usually the lighting is done. Just to give you an idea about it lah, for modern lighting design. <coughs> so, uh, luminous is the light within that holds or contain a lamp. So this is something that holds a lamp lah. So the function is to absorb, redirect some of the luminous flux emitted by the lamp. So you'll be able to position the lamp away from the ceiling and you'll also be able to direct the lamp, the direction of your lighting. Okay, so next is your artificial lighting design. <clears throat> because we cannot always depend on natural sunlight, so that's why we need artificial lighting design. <clears throat> Natural sunlight by itself is actually very, very bright. So in Malaysia, <clears throat> if you have natural sunlight, means you have a window in your room. So if you by, by just opening the window, you have all the brightness required to do your task. But because you are living in a modern, modern world, so we need a very reliable source of lighting. So that's why it comes to this sort of study. We have an artificial lighting design study. So we have this illuminance level. So what we do any for any particular task we do, we, we need a sort of level of illuminance. So for example, if you just need to have a clear path to see, you don't need a very, very high level of illuminance, such as the passageway, stair, entrance, and foyer. So we just need minimum level of brightness. So the illuminance needed for a particular task depends on three functions. 
So the visual difficulty of the task means is it something that we need to be very precise about? The average standard of eyesight expected, do we need to see it very, very far or we need to see it very clear? And the type of performance expected. So are we required to read and work on it on this area? So based on this needs, the level of illuminance or the brightness required on a surface or in the area will be higher. So if you were to look at it, at this table here, for public spaces, we only need 100 to 200 illuminance. So this is just enough to light up the area and for us to walk so that we don't trip over anything. For restaurant area, we need about 150, just enough for us to see our food and eat our food. And then as you go up in in different different requirements, such, uh, such as the retail display, we need uh, for a retail display, we want to be able to see the product clearly. So this is to entice you to buy lah and to look at the stuff, which is to show to, to showcase the product is new, nice, and a good buy for you guys. Lah. So it uses a very, very high illuminance to highlight the product. And then it goes to your, the next is your office space. So office space, you want to do work. So mainly in your computer or on paper means you're doing, you're writing up your report or, or reading the report. So you need a minimum level of brightness, which is at about 300. So if your brightness is not enough, you'll find it very difficult to read all those fine print or words in a paper, in a piece of paper. So as a standard minimal requirement, if you were to be at a classroom or a library, you want to have at least 300 to 400 lah level of illuminance for us to be very comfortable doing the fine task. And finally, at our home, we just need about 150 to 300 lah, depending on the type of task you want to do. So generally, about 300 is good enough. Lah. Okay, so this is the final few formula. This is a Lumen method, which is to find out how many number of lamp fitting is required. So based on the illuminance required and the area and the initial luminous flux output of each lamp and also the utilization factor LLF. So this, by knowing all of this, if you were to multiply it, <coughs> you'll be able to find out the number of lamp fitting required. <coughs> So usually all of this info for this, when you are required to do this, most of the variable, the factors will be given. Lah. So maybe you won't be given the UF or the LLF or the N. Lah. So you need to find out what is the number of lamp or the UF utilization factor. Okay. So this is a table 6.4, the utilization factor. So as I mentioned, usually this is not given. You have to find out. So the light loss factor will be given to you. Most of the time uh, will be given to you. But UF, you will have to find out using this table 6.4. So it's a utilization factor for some luminaries. So to find out this you add, you will be given the description of your fitting. Lah. Is it is a aluminum industrial defector or a near spher spherical diffuser or is it a recessed loaf? So based on these three, you have to tell you what is it, what type of fitting it is. And then you have to know what you, uh, you also be given the ceiling reflectance 
So the ceiling reflectance can be 0 0.7, 0 0.5, or 0 0.3. So if it's 0 0.7, it will be at this area. Lah. If it's 0 0.3, it will be at this. And then for the wall, so you have three types of different reflectance, 0 0.5, 0 0.3, and 0 0.1. So if your ceiling is 0 0.7 and your wall is 0 0.3, so you look at this column. And then based on your type of fitting, if it's this fitting, you look at this column, uh, this area. Uh, sorry, this column. And then you have to find out your room index. So your room index, you have to use this formula. Lah. Okay. So this is a uh, table 6.3 is a uh, illuminance standard service illuminance. So this is just for your additional info. If you, you may use this for your assignment. But if you can find out a more suitable source, that will be better. It shows that you find there's a standard form of practice out there, the form where it gives you a very detailed form standard service illuminance. So you can still use this, but if you were to find out online the standard form, it will be better. Lah. And by doing this extra work, your mark will also be better than those who just take from this standard service illuminance. Lah. I'll still accept it, but if you were to find online, then you'll get a higher mark. Lah as compared to those who just take from the lecture slides. Okay, so coming back to this, how to pick your utilization factor. I explained ceiling, walls, the description of the fitting, and then finally, you need to find out your room index. So you have a lot of value here. So to find out your room index, you need to use this formula, RI. So RI is a number which takes account of the proportion of the room. So you have your length multiplied by width, and then you have your HM. So HM is the mounted height of fitting above the working space. So this is the only thing you need to remember. So the rest you can don't really mind it. So this is the second formula. So this formula and this formula is linked together. So you need this RI, you know your length and width of your room, and also with the height of your fitting from your working area, you can you'll be able to find out what is your RI. So with your room index, you'll be able to find either it's a 1 or 1.5. Let's say for example 1.5 you're given ceiling 0 0.7, your wall 0 0.3, and 1.5, your utilization factor will be 0 0.57. So this is how you find out your UF. Lah. And then with this UF, you can put it in, and you'll be able to find out your number of lamp fitting required. Okay, so an example of this previous, how to do all of this after I explain it through. So you're given a space of 40 meter by 12 and 4. So 40 times 12 times 4. So 4 is, is in height. And this area requires a service illuminance of 500 lux on the boat bench. So it's set 1 meter above the floor. And this, you're given a 65 watt tubular fluorescent lamp chosen have a luminous efficiency of 80 lumen per watt. So they are mounted on the wall and your workbench is 1 meter. So this has a DLOR of 50%. Room reflectors of 0 0.5 for ceiling and 0 0.3 for wall and initial light loss factor is 0 0.7 so there's a and b is asking you to find the numbers of lamp required and then suggest a suitable layout for lamp fitting so 
it asking you to find the lamp required if you were to look back this is your formula required and you are not given the uf so you need to find out your uf using the ri and using this table okay so given the information the last required is 500 and all this information extracted from the example here so you need to find out your lumen so 65 times 80 you get a 5200 lumen am i So you know your HM. <coughs> so 4 minus 1, you are given that your workbench is 1 meter, but your lighting is mounted on the ceiling, which is 4 meter height. So it, your HM is 3 meter. And you know your area is 40 times 12. So 40 times 12 times 4, this is your area. So we know your length and width. And you know your HM, so you'll be able to find out your R is 3, your room index. So your R is 3, ceiling is 0 0.7, uh, ceiling is 0 0.5, wall is 0 0.3. If you look at the table 6.4, your ceiling is 0 0.5, your wall is 0 0.3, and your room index is 3. So your type of fitting is this. So if you were to just go it down here, you get 0 0.46. So this is how you get uh, the utilization factor, 0 0.46. So you put all of this information into your formula to find out your N, you get 143.3. So this is the number of lamp, minimum number of lamp required. But since you cannot have 0 0.3 number of lamp, you have to round it up. Uh. So you run up to 144 and you get your minimum, uh, you have your number of lamp required, which is this, 144. So suggest, uh, that's how you do for part A. Lah. So for B, suggest a suitable layout for the lamp fitting. So check the spacing using the S max, so 1.5 times HM, you get 4.5. So suggest layout is satisfactory, provided that distance between them is not greater than 4.5 meter. So this spacing is just multiply lah by this lah. Okay, so there's eight criteria to the selection of lighting. So you have your light quantity, natural light, color quality, glare, directional quality, energy use, cost, and physical properties. So this is the standard eight factors. Lah. What sort of lighting design you require depending on what sort of area you want to light up. So depending on is it a rental space, a rental display, which you want a high luminous, a high brightness, or you want to light up a office area, or you want a modern looking living room, you have different different type of factors to consider when you select your lighting system. So these are the eight types, and you always want to have a low glare lah. So if you want to have zero glare, you'll be like what I just showed you just now in a modern look, a modern living area. So you won't have any direct lighting, all the lighting you have will be indirect lighting. And depending on the quality, you'll be able to set the ambience of the area. So a uh, more light color will 
subtly change the perspective of the environment. Okay, so next you have your natural light source, which is the sun. So it is always necessary to provide a room with natural daylight from the sun because it's always available. We should always make use of it since it's free. So a room can use both natural and artificial light. So natural light is easily emitted into the building by means of window or skylight. So the quantity of light is governed by the nature and brightness of the sky, size and shape and position of the window, reflection from surface inside the room, reflection and obstruction from object outside the room. So because sunlight by itself has a very, very high brightness, so it can be as high as 100,000 lux, you always need to find a way to ensure that direct sunlight is avoided inside a building. Because if you were to look directly at the sun, it will give you a very blinding glare. So it will actually hurt your eye. So to prevent that, for a building, we have a few ways to control. So one of the way to control is externally. We have a awning, window screen. Internally, we have blind and curtain. And finally, we have special glass tinting and low E glass. So tinting is the, if you notice, is for car. Lah. So you'll be able to view up, but sunlight will have a difficulty in penetrating through the glass to go into your house. So awning and window screen is something you will see in this picture here. So it's a, let me expand it. So it's a type of curtain wall that's fitted to ensure that you won't have a direct sight of the sunlight. The sunlight will not have a direct path into your room but you will have to go through an indirect pathway lah to reach into your room. So this is an awning or a window screen. Lah. So you have your standard sky. So the uh, sun is always considered a reasonable source of light, but it varies lah by times of day season of year and local weather. But in Malaysia, we only have one season, which is summer all year long. So we don't have any differences in this time, season of the year and local weather. So two uh, mathematical models have been developed for luminous distribution of an overcast sky. So an overcast sky is a sky where the sun is covered by the cloud. So you have two, which is a uniform standard sky and a CIE standard sky. So here, if, if you cannot remember, uh, if you want to read it, we will read this again. So an over, as I mentioned, an overcast sky is one which the outline of sun cannot be seen through the cloud cover. So for calculation purpose, the overcast sky represents the worst type of daylighting situation. So why is it say so? Because once the sun is being covered, then the lighting from the sun is reduced exponentially. So that's why for calculation purpose, an overcast sky where the sun is covered by the cloud and cannot be seen provides the least amount of natural light to a building or to us. Ah. Okay, so a uh, uniform standard sky is a uh, overcast sky which is taken to have the same luminous in every direction of sky. So a constant of 5000 is taken as one standard for daylight calculation. So it's assumed that the surface being lighted up by this sun 
is equal. So this is just a general information on the two types of mathematical model developed to find out the natural lighting calculation. So we have this daylight factor. So a daylight factor is the amount of daylight in a room that can be measured by comparing it to the daylight available outside the room. So this ratio or daylight factor remain constant because the two part of the ratio varies in the same manner as the sky change. So you are represented by this formula, DF, which is the daylight factor. You have your EI divided by your EO. So illuminance at the reference point inside the room and illuminance at the point if the sky was obstructed. So with that, by dividing the illuminance at that point of the room and the natural light, you'll be able to find out what is the daylight factor multiplied by 100%. So a standard example, a very simple example. So you're given a minimum daylight factor of 4% is required at a certain point inside a room. And then you have to calculate the natural illuminance that represent this, assuming that an unobstructed standard sky gives an illuminance of 5,000 lights. So you just put all of this information in and you'll be able to find out that your natural illuminance is 200 lux. So you just apply the formula on here. So this is a table that shows the, that represents the recommendation daylight factor for various interior tasks. So as I mentioned, the, uh, sunlight is free. Artificial light costs money and needs to re be replaced. So we always need a constant mixture of these two types of lighting. But for daylight, because it's free, we just need to install a window on it. Then it always makes sense to use it. Lah. So there's already a standard established out there, like the minimum of minimum requirement lux available. So this is a standard already established. So we want a average minimum amount of daylight factor for this sort of area here and at this surface. Okay, so we have the, finally we have this, the daylight reaching a particular point inside a room is actually made up of three principal components. So we have a natural light, we have our artificial light and we have a combination of both of them. So here we have our scan component. We have our externally reflected component, ERC, and we have our internally reflected component. So sky component is direct sunlight. And then externally reflected component is the light received directly by reflection from building and landscape outside the room. So the sunlight is for this ERC, the sunlight is being reflected from another object into this room. And for the internally reflected component, the light reflected by reflection from surface inside the building. So it's an indirect sunlight. So the sunlight is hitting into the room, but it's not directly onto the reference point. So it's just bouncing around, giving, uh, being reduced uh, the brightness and also lighting up this point. So daylight factor component is obtained through all of these variables, direct, externally reflected component from the sun, from other objects outside the room, and internally reflected component inside this room by itself. So these three components make up the daylight factor component. So this is an example. So combination of artificial lighting with natural lighting is necessary to provide adequate level of natural illumination to all parts of room, especially the interior. So this is to preserve the physical, uh, physical benefit or effect of full daylight as much as possible. 
Okay, so finally we have our this parsley. So it's a permanent su supplementary artificial lighting of interior. So it's a system of combined day lighting and artificial lighting where parts of an interior are lit for the whole time by artificial light, which is designed to balance and blend with the daylight. So this is a controlled by solar activated controller. So this is something like a smart home system. So it's to switch on automatically to provide illuminance either daytime in those parts of a room which are remote from window or during night time. So for areas in which natural light is unable to reach, this is the type of system in place. So it allows the use of deeper room plan which can save energy because of lower heat loss. So this is some of like a smart light system. Because lighting will not be able to reach all the area for when your room is very, very big. Because there's only up to a maximum of how far your window can light up your room. So we always need a supplementary artificial lighting. So during, uh, this will always be on. Lah. This is a supplement to ensure that the area in your room is always bright enough. And when it's during the night time where natural lighting is not available, then you have your artificial lighting in which you can turn on. So you have your normal artificial lighting and also your permanent supplementary artificial lighting of interior. So this will always be switched on regardless of the time of the day either it's morning or night so if you can see here uh, gra uh, there's a line here so during daytime illumination although there's natural sunlight is still not enough so that's why you need this parsley so with this supplementary you have a good level of illumination to do your work inside this room but if you don't uh, if you don't have it, then at this part of the room, you'll find that your sight is reduced uh, due to the low brightness. So illumination due to this additional permanent supplementary light can be seen on this line. So do note that you remember on the previous lesson on the inverse log. which is this inverse square law of illuminance. So the further light goes, the less bright it is. So you won't be able to light up your whole room using just a single light bulb because the light energy loses its efficiency over a uh, area. So because of this law, we need to have sufficient lighting we need to install this uh, supplementary permanent lighting here. So this is the this is it lah about your lighting design. So with this slide and this understanding, I hope you guys will be able to do your assignment lah. So lighting is a very interesting subject. Usually, it's more towards architects lah, who design the lighting. So architects will have to provide, uh, they, will, they are always the one who provide the design. Lah. And with different different type of lighting, they'll be able to showcase different different type of the building and provide different different type of ambience to the area. So how, the, how they install the lighting and what sort of design they do, it will affect the room a lot, lah, the ambience of the room. So that's about it for this lesson. So hope you guys understand.